Good morning and welcome to worship on this lovely Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here either with us in person or online. A few announcements before we begin. Upper room devotionals for September, that's this month and October, are available on the table as you leave the sink, uh, as, you, as you head out through the office doors. Please go ahead and grab one if you're interested. Uh, Liz continues to look for worship volunteers for the months of November and December. If you feel up to the challenge of reading scripture, please get in contact with Liz. We would appreciate it. You've heard me say this many times before and likely will continue to hear me say it for some time in the future. For our COVID-19 safe protocols for worship, we are currently worshiping outdoors. We ask that you do keep your masks on unless you are actively leading worship and that you do your best to maintain social distance, but that is why we are outside and not inside. This session will be taking a look at our COVID-19 protocols at our upcoming session meeting on Thursday. We will publicize any changes that are made to those protocols through the seminarium. Are there any other, I feel like I'm missing an announcement, but I can't. Liz? Just one more announcement. Uh, we have to thank Carrie. Yes, a huge thank you to the Brenegers who have stepped up to play music at this time. We're really, really grateful for your ministry among us. Unfortunately, none of our pianists can play music for us while we are outdoors because there's no way to get a piano out here. If you have an electric keyboard, we could get some piano music. So, you know, if you have one or you know of someone who might be willing to lend it to us, we would appreciate it. The microphone is on. Can everyone hear me? Let me see if I can turn the speaker. Is that better? Okay. And I'll continue to sort of eat the mic. <laughs> Durante este tiempo de COVID, seguimos siendo la iglesia. Adorando a Dios juntos, aunque no estemos todos juntos en un solo espacio. En Dios somos una iglesia, más grande de lo que podría contener cualquier edificio. Gracias. Adios. During this time of COVID, we continue to be the church, worshiping God together, even though we are not all together in one space. In God, we are made one church bigger than any building might contain. Thanks be to God. Este es el día que hizo el Señor. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hear these words from Psalm 116. Amo al Señor, pues ha escuchado mi voz y mis súplicas porque ha inclinado a mí su oído. Por tanto, le invocaré todos mis días. Me rodearon las ataduras de la muerte. Me encontraron las angustias del seo. En angustia y en dolor me encontraba. Entonces invoqué el nombre del Señor diciendo, Libra, oh Señor, mi vida. Clemente y justo es el Señor, sí, Misericordioso es nuestro Dios. El Señor guarda los ingenuos. Estaba yo prostrado, y Él me salvó. Vuelve, oh alma mía, a tu reposo, porque el Señor te ha favorecido. Porque tú has librado mi vida de la muerte, mis ojos de las lágrimas y mis pies de la caída. 
andaré delante del Señor en la tierra de los vivientes. Whenever we pass through deep waters or go through times of fiery trial, the Lord our God is with us. With confidence in God, our Creator and our Redeemer, let us confess our sin. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousy that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Amen. Cualquiera que está en Cristo nueva criatura es. El pasado ha quedado atrás. Todo vuelve a ser puro y nuevo. Beloved, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. You got to get it right up in your mouth. Oh, I'm not used to this. That's kind of just. Now does that work? Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> well, okay, start again. Good morning. Good morning. I was thinking last night about the church as a community of people. And it makes a difference to me that I be here in this place in your presence. So let us read from and hear God's word to us as those who are together, his church in the world. The reading this morning is from Mark 8 verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who, does that, who do people say I am? And they answered it, John the Baptist, and others said Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, yeah, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, 
but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed. And when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Take this reading to our understanding. So does it, do we have music now? I'm going to read in Spanish and you're all good. You can sit for a moment. Mm -hmm. You can sit for a moment. La lectura bíblica se encuentra en Marcos. Después de esto, Jesús y sus discípulos fueron a las aldeas de la región de Cesarea de Filipo. En el camino, Jesús preguntó a sus discípulos, ¿Quién dice la gente que soy yo? Ellos contestaron, Algunos dicen que eres Juan el Bautista, otros dicen que eres Elías, y otros dicen que eres uno de los profetas. ¿Y ustedes? ¿Quién dicen que soy? Les preguntó. Pedro le respondió, Tú eres el Mesías. Pero Jesús les ordenó que no hablaran de él a nadie. Jesús comenzó a enseñarles que el Hijo del Hombre tendría que sufrir mucho y que sería rechazado por los ancianos, por los jefes de los sacerdotes y por los maestros de la ley. Les dijo que lo iban a matar, pero que resucitaría a los tres días. Esto se lo advirtió claramente. Entonces Pedro lo llevó aparte y comenzó a reprenderlo. Pero Jesús se volvió, miró a los discípulos y reprendió a Pedro, diciéndole, Apart, apártate de mí, Santanas. Tú no ves las cosas como la, las ve Dios, sino como las ven los hombres. Luego Jesús llamó a sus discípulos y a la gente y dijo, Si alguno quiere ser discípulo mío, olvídese de sí mismo, cargue con su cruz y sígame, porque el que quiera salvar su vida la perderá. Perderá. Pero el que pierda la vida por causa mía y por aceptar el evangelio, la salvará. ¿De qué le sirve al hombre ganar el mundo entero si pierde la vida? ¿O también cuánto podrá pagar el hombre por su vida? Pues, si alguno se avergüenza de mí y de mi mensaje delante de esta gente infiel y pecadora, también el Hijo del Hombre se avergonzará de él cuando venga con la gloria de su Padre y con los santos ángeles. Esto es palabra de Dios. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. At some point during seminary, I was fretting about something, I don't remember what, and I posted something on social media about it. And a friend responded, just be Peter. 
it will tell you something about how I was feeling that I responded overconfident and always missing the point. <laughs> Bless him, I got an implied eye roll. Anxiety spiral much? And the much kinder response, no, be like Peter, be a rock. You can do this. I think about that exchange a lot whenever a Peter pops up in our texts. In my head, I forget that there is only one Peter, not two. Peter, the perpetually befuddled disciple, and Peter, the rock on which the church was built. What a relief that they are one and the same. We are vast. We contain multitudes. Or as my best friend likes to say, we are not one-dimensional characters in a novel. So it makes sense that it is only Peter, brave and honest Peter, who answers Jesus' question with the truth. You are the Messiah. And equally, it makes sense that just a few sentences later, Jesus is rebuking Peter. Because Peter believes Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, the one foretold who will save them all. And Peter thinks that he knows what this means. He already has a picture in his mind of what it means to be the Messiah. He wants Jesus to deliver on that picture, to release them from the Roman Empire, to usher in a golden age of peace and prosperity. He emphatically does not want a Messiah who preaches about his own death, who suggests that God's plan might not, in fact, look like the overthrow of the Roman Empire. So it is Peter, brave and foolhardy Peter, who takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. You can't say that. I can almost hear him hiss. What are you doing? This is not who the Messiah is supposed to be. No one will follow you if you say these things. Poor Peter. His fate is sealed as soon as he tugged on Jesus' arm to pull him aside. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus responds. Can you imagine Peter's mortification? Just thinking about it gives me secondhand embarrassment, makes the back of my neck heat up and my stomach sink. Because we've all been Peter at one point or another, in all his brave honesty and also in all his foolhardiness. And has this not also been the struggle of the church throughout our many centuries as we try to balance following Jesus with living in this world? So often those things are in conflict and it is so easy to get caught up in the human side of things, things like safety and comfort, social approbation, I think about the German Christian church during Hitler's rise to power in the 1930s, and frankly about Christian churches across Europe and here in North America. I think about the theological declaration of Barman written by the German evangelical church in 1933, denouncing Hitler's consolidation of power and totalitarianism, but stopping short of denouncing his persecution of the Jewish people. And I think about the way that the theologians who penned that declaration spoke about it after the war, that they were ashamed of themselves, that by not speaking out about the genocide of a whole people, they had failed to live out the gospel. Would we have done any different? We want the church, we want Jesus to conform to our own ideas and ideals. Like Peter, we already have our own images of what Jesus would do, who he would support. 
And like Peter, we are all too ready to take him to task for not following what we think he ought to be doing. And so, like Peter, again and again, we are rebuked for missing the point. Take up your cross and follow me. Those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. Hard lessons. But the church on occasion and us on occasion we're also Peter the Rock. We get it right sometimes. And even more occasionally, we get it right in big and bureaucratic ways. Votes in support of the abolition of slavery. Votes that demanded that women be ordained. Votes that permitted LGBTQ persons to be ordained. Votes that recognized marriage as a gift between any two consenting adults, not just a man and a woman. And the church, our church, lost members over every single one of those votes. Most of them precipitated schisms in our denomination. The Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States of America, the Presbyterian Church in America, the Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterians. All of these were once part of us. And eventually the Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States did rejoin the denomination, but the scars from that split remain low these many, many years. All those moments where the church at large looked at the threat of the loss of members, of property, of funds, and said, these are human things and we are concerned with divine things. I was a theological student advisory delegate to the General Assembly that took the final vote to approve the newest addition to our Book of Confessions changes to the Book of Confessions, which is part of our Constitution as Presbyterians, are the hardest to make. They require, in this exact order, approval to form a study committee by the full General Assembly. That that study be completed and presented to the following assembly that that assembly approve the recommendation of that confession and send it to all of the presbyteries of the PCUSA for their vote. That two thirds of those presbyteries approve that recommendation. And finally, that the next assembly also approve that recommendation by a two thirds majority. It can take decades for a new confession to be added to our Constitution. But I was there in 2016 and cast my advisory vote on the final round of votes to include the Confession of Belhar in our Book of Confessions. For those of you who don't know, one of the questions we as the PCUSA ask all who will be ordained and installed into any church office, pastor, deacon, elder, if they will be guided by our confessions. The confessions are subordinate only to scripture in our understanding, our Presbyterian understanding, bureaucratic as it may be, of the world. The confessions are deeply integral to our denomination, even if many, perhaps even most, will never ever read them. So the addition of the Confession of Belhar, the first confession of the global majority to be added to our Book of Confessions, 
was a big deal. Belhar was written by the Black South African Dutch Reformed Church in the 1980s, and it explicitly casts apartheid and racism as sin, as doctrine, contrary to the gospel. And additionally, it confesses that any doctrine that divides on the basis of the color of someone's skin is heresy. It's a powerful confession. And these are the final three sentences. We believe that in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and do all these things, even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them and punishment and suffering be the consequence. Jesus is Lord. To the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and glory forever and ever. Even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them, and punishment and suffering be the consequence, take up your cross and follow me. Those who lose my, their life for the sake of my life and the life of the gospel will save it. It's easy, even understandable, that we want to flinch away from these stark choices. We don't want to lose our lives. We don't want our loved ones harmed. And yet we are called to follow Christ, though consequences may indeed be dire. Of course, living in the United States, I want to be very clear, we are in very little actual danger. Christians are not, no matter what you may hear on the news, persecuted in this country. And yet, peer pressure is a strong thing, not just for teenagers, but for all of us adults, too. So it's a good thing we have Peter. Peter, who gets it wrong over and over again. Peter, who is always welcomed back. Peter, who is the rock on which the church is built. Because what Peter means is we don't have to get it right every time. We don't have to be perfect. We are welcomed. We are valued anyway. We are loved. Even when we get it wrong, we are forgiven and even invited to try again, to try and focus on divine things, not human things, which hard as it is, means that we are called to work against human things like peer pressure, like unjust laws, like social expectations that break people down. And we will get it wrong. It's hard to do those things. It's easy to misstep or to pretend you didn't hear that thing. And unfortunately, we are not called to do the easy thing. And this is why we confess week after week. This is why our statements of belief are called confessions. Because we are called to be honest with ourselves, with one another, and with God about the false ideals that we hold to so that we can move past them. The Uniting Reformed Church of South Africa wrote a letter when they adopted the Confession of Belhar. And the first paragraph of that letter finds out well and far more eloquently than I ever could why we call these things confessions. We are deeply conscious, they wrote, that mom moments of such seriousness can arise in the life of the church that it may feel need the need to confess its faith anew 
in the light of a specific situation. We are aware that such an act of confession is not likely undertaken, but only if it is considered that the heart of the gospel is so threatened as to be at stake. In our judgment, the present church and political situation in our country, and particularly within the Dutch Reformed Church family, calls for such a, division, a decision. Accordingly, we make this confession not as a contribution to a theological debate, nor as a new summary of our beliefs, but as a cry from the heart, as something we are obliged to do for the sake of the gospel in view of the times in which we stand. Along with many, we confess our guilt in that we have not always witnessed clearly enough in our situation and so are jointly responsible for the way in which those things which were experienced as sin and confessed to be sin have grown in time to seem self-evidently right and to be ideologies foreign to scriptures. As a result, many have been given the impression that the gospel was not really at stake. We make this confession because we are convinced that all sorts of theological arguments have contributed to so disproportionate an emphasis on some aspects of the truth that it has, in effect, become a lie. This is who we are called to be. Not perfect, but confessing and ever striving to be Peters in our own right and in our own way, imperfect and beloved. May it be so. Amen. One tradition in Reformed worship is that a confession of faith follows the proclamation of the word. Usually all would be invited to read it aloud. Today I invite you to listen to these words coming to us from South Africa in 1986 and confessing together what we believe. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the world, the church, through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do so to the end. We believe in one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. That unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ. That through the working of God's spirit, it is a binding force yet simultaneously a reality which must be earnestly pursued and sought one which the people of God must continually be built up to attain. That this unity must become visible so that the world may believe that separation, enmity, and hatred between people and groups is sin, which Christ has already conquered. And accordingly, that anything which threatens this unity may have no place in the church and must be resisted that this unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways, in that we love one another, that we experience, practice, and pursue community with one another, that we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of benefit and blessing to one another, that we share one faith, have one calling, are of one soul and one mind, have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism, eat of one bread and drink of one cup, confess one name, are obedient to one Lord, work for one cause and share one hope. Together, come to know the height and the breadth and the depth of the love of Christ. Together are built up to the stature of Christ, to the new humanity, Together, know and bear one another's burdens. 
thereby fulfilling the law of Christ that we need one another and upbuild one another, admonishing and comforting one another that we suffer with one another for the sake of righteousness, pray together, together serve God in this world and together fight against all which may threaten or hinder this unity that this unity can be established only in freedom and not under constraint. That the variety of spiritual gifts, opportunities, backgrounds, convictions, as well as the various languages and cultures are by virtue of the reconciliation in Christ, opportunities for mutual service and enrichment within the one visible people of God. That true faith in Jesus Christ is the only condition for membership of this church Therefore, we reject any doctrine which absolutizes either natural diversity or the sinful separation of people in such a way that this absolutization hinders or breaks the visible and active unity of the church, or even leads to the separation, to the establishment of a separate church formation. We reject any doctrine which professes that this spiritual unity is truly being maintained in the bond of peace while believers of the same confession are in effect alienated from one another for the sake of diversity and in despair of reconciliation. We reject any doctrine which denies that a refusal earnestly to pursue this visible unity as a priceless gift is sin. We reject any doctrine which explicitly or implicitly maintains that dissent or any other human or social factor should be a consideration in determining membership of the church. We believe that God has entrusted the church with the message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ, that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that the church is called to be blessed because it is a peacemaker, that the church is witnessed both by word and by deed to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells that God's life-giving word and spirit has conquered the powers of sin and death and therefore also of irreconciliation and hatred, bitterness and enmity, that God's life-giving word and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience, which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world, that the credibility of this message is seriously affected and its beneficial work obstructed when it is a proclaimed in a land that professes to be Christian, but in which the enforced separation of people on racial basis promotes and perpetuates alienation, hatred, and enmity. That any teaching which attempts to legitimate such forced separation by appeal to the gospel and is not prepared to venture on the road of obedience and reconciliation, but rather out of prejudice, fear, selfishness, and unbelief, denies and advance the reconciling power of the gospel must be considered ideology and false doctrine. Therefore, we reject any doctrine which in such a situation sanctions in the name of the gospel or of the will of God, this forced separation of people on the grounds of race and color and thereby in advance obstructs and weakens the ministry and experience of reconciliation in Christ. We believe that God has revealed God's self as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God, in a world full of injustice and enmity, is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. That God calls the church to follow him in this, for God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry. That God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind. That God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly. That for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering. That God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. That the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies among other things, that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice so that justice may roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream, that the church as the possession of God must stand where the Lord stands, 
namely against injustice and with the wronged. That in following Christ, the church must seek witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. Therefore, we reject any ideology which would legitimate forms of injustice and any doctrine which is unwilling to resist such an ideology in the name of the gospel. We believe that in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and to do all these things, even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them, and punishment and suffering be the consequence. Jesus is Lord. To God, to the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Heaven and earth are yours, O Lord, and of your own we give you. When we pass the offering plate down the pew, person to person, we feel that sense of being part of our church community. We can't do that now. But whether you have joined us from at home or are sitting together with us in this courtyard, we know the importance of sharing what we have with your church and with our world. So an offering plate is on the table. And as you leave, uh, feel free to uh, make a donation there. And if you're not here in person, Please put a check for your offering in the mail. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we offer in feeding the world with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now as that community gathered here together in person and online, we pray the prayers of the people, of this people gathered here, of people around the world. Let us pray. God with us, we are grateful for your presence. 
calm our pandemic anxieties and fears. We pray for children and parents as children go back to school, for wisdom from school boards and principals for safe practices for negative COVID-19 tests. For all those in quarantine waiting to see what happens, we ask your comfort and peace. For all those who have COVID at home or in hospital, we pray for healing and wholeness. In the midst of this pandemic, even as our cry goes up, how long, O oh Lord, we continue to sing your praises, for you are the God who came down to be with us, in the flesh among us. And you know what it is like to be like us. Justice bringer, be with all those who face injustice. We pray that your justice comes for all those who find no justice in our own systems. Help us remember that all are created in your image and your image is expansive, far greater and grander than our small imaginations. We pray for the childbearing people of Texas for the loss of their ability to make their own reproductive choices and the creation of a system that rewards turning in anyone who might help people make their own reproductive choices. Remind us of your call to work toward abundant life for all people. The struggle is long. Grant us perseverance and strength as we continue. God of peace, we pray for all those places where there is no peace, for places where gunfire echoes, where militaristic forces terrorize, where the earth shakes with the use of force against one another. This week, this month, feel heavy with violence, God of peace. We pray for Afghanistan and the Afghan people in the wake of the U.S.'s departure. Be with them, comfort them. Renew our sense of call to work for peace in your world. Help us to work toward your vision of swords turned into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Life giver, thank you for your good creation. Greening ground, chirping sparrow, howling coyote. And yet your good creation is groaning under the weight of the destruction we have wrought. Help us to change our ways that we might live in harmony with creation. We pray for all those affected by wildfires that rage, by waters that flood. Keep all those in their paths safe. Protect all who go out to protect others. God, our healer, we pray for all those we know and love in need of your healing. For Otis, for Brian, for Carmen and her brother and sister-in-law, for Suzanne, for Terry, for Bill, and for Olivia. Be with them, comfort them in their distress. Give them strength and courage as they face the future. God, we also pray for all those we do not know, for those whose names we don't know, who need your healing but are alone. We lift them up to you as well. Comforter, we pray for all who mourn, especially this weekend. We pray for all of those who were affected by the September 11th attacks in 2001, by the families of those who died in the attacks, by the families of those who have been affected by U.S. and national retaliation. Help us to remember that your love is stronger even than death. All this we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We believe that in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and do all these things, even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them, and punishment and suffering be the consequence. May the blessing of the Holy Triune God who was and is and is to come, first and last, beginning and end, Alpha and Omega, be with you now and always. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>